morning, everyone. My name is Martha Rudolph, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Environmental Health Matters Initiative. On behalf of the Environmental Health Matters Initiative, and in collaboration with the Roundtable on Plastics, I'd like to welcome you to our first webinar in a broader series on microplastics and health. I ask that you check the links in the chat room, or check, check the chat room for the links. The goal of this first webinar, titled Introduction to Microplastics and Health Implications, Where Are We and Where Are We Going?, is to provide a level setting for our understanding of interactions between microplastics and human health. What questions remain to advance this understanding and what is needed in charting a path forward? Today's discussion will build a knowledge base and inform future work in this series. The series aims to assist in identifying gaps in research, regulatory practices, and cross-sectoral decision-making regarding reducing microplastic risks to human health. I'd like to acknowledge that while we are gathered virtually today, the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nakuchtank and Tuscatawi peoples, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and her stewards, whose relationship spans generations. One of the EHMI priorities is implementing a comprehensive systems approach for environmental health solutions. We recognize that indigenous nations have distinct knowledge systems and ways of knowing that hold wisdom for how to live with the land. Respecting this knowledge as we gather to discuss living in an environment polluted with microplastics, it is our duty to listen and work with those who see with two eyes to create better, safer communities for all in the future. For this workshop, we want to thank the working group and members from both collaborating activities on this project for their thoughtful contrib contributions, the National Academy staff, and today's moderators, speakers, and panelists all of whom have worked hard to bring together this exciting event. We also want to thank our sponsors, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Institute of Environmental Health Science for this first webinar. Now let's turn to today's webinar. We will have two sessions. The first will be an introduction to microplastics. What are microplastics? Why are there concerns over them? And why is this such a complex issue? We will then have a multi-sectoral panel discussion that will delve deeper into what work has already been done, what lessons we can bring forward, and areas to identify research gaps within the context of risks to human health. We will end the webinar with an interactive chat activity to hear from you, the audience, so please be ready to contribute. Then we'll follow a brief reflection on today's discussion. We expect this series on microplastics will help pave the way for more research and connections to policy. Let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Tuklick, the leader of the Biochemical and Exposure Science Group at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. He will moderate our first se session. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martha, uh, for the introduction. So the goals of our first workshop are to level set for the current state of knowledge for microplastics, including the associated concerns and complexities and identify what animal analytical information is available and what might be missing. We have uh, highly knowledgeable speakers joining us for this session. Margaret Spring is Chief uh, Conservation and Science Officer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and worked on this project in collaboration as a member of the Roundtable on Plastics uh, at the National Academies. Dr. Robert Ellis Hutchings is Senior Toxicology Scientist in the Toxicology and Environmental Health Research and Consulting Branch at Dow, and their biographies are available on the website. The two speakers will have a total of 25 minutes to pro provide their thoughts 
and then we will open up the session for questions. Audience, our audience members are invited to submit their questions at any time using the Slido link, where everyone can also upvote questions they most want answered. The Zoom chat is also available for discussion today. Please use it to share related work, including your own, or other information relevant to, today, to today's webinar. And a reminder to please use the chat wisely. So with that, uh, Margaret and Rob, please unmute yourselves and start sharing the screen. And you will have 25 minutes from now for presentations and you will receive a two minute uh, reminder uh, in the chat when you're uh, nearing the end of your time. So with that, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, I am just working on sharing my screen. Thank you, Rob, for driving. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Please let me know if you're able to see. Can see it. Sharing. Needs to go in presentation mode. And I'm working on that. Sorry about this. All right, are you able to see the slides? Let me get back up to the top. Yep, we can see them. Oh, great. All right, good. Uh, welcome, everyone. I, I do want to start by thanking uh, the organizing committee and also thanking my co-presenter uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we do have a unique opportunity to co-present together, Margaret and myself, and that's what we'll be doing throughout the presentation today. We'll be going back and forth. Uh, throughout. So hopefully that uh, gives a dynamic that's helpful to the audience. Um, and hopefully the two perspectives that we'll bring forth will be um, valuable. I wanted to start by giving you some perspective on terms because the terms in this space are critically important. So first, uh, what are microplastics? So the WHO or World Health Organization gives a uh, a basic definition here that I think is helpful. There's more complexity to it. There's many definitions that exist, but this is a good starting definition. Namely, microplastics are plastic particles less than five millimeters in length. Uh, they, they can go all the way down to the nanospace. Some definitions stop at one micron. Uh, another distinguishing feature of microplastics are their shape. They come in a variety of shapes, such as irregular fragments, spheres, fibers, which we'll talk about specifically in a moment, and films. Uh, other key characteristics are composition and also surface char characteristics. Uh, what are particles, right? We talk about microplastics as particles, so pretty straightforward here. I've given you one definition from the EU Commission in terms of physical boundaries. And then microfibers. And the question is, what are they? And are they microplastics? And I've given you a definition here again from the World Health Organization on what they consider a microfiber. Uh, and then there's information that's available both from the WHO and this report that I'm showing on the right from the EPA and NOAA as a coordinating committee on specific aspects of microfibers uh, and their relation to microplastics. So there's a lot more to that story. I'll get to this later, but one thing to be aware is microfibers are among the least studied of the different types of microplastics, and we'll share more on that in a bit. Continuing on with the terms, uh, what are plastics? So plastics are high molecular weight, that's a relative sense, uh, polymers. So 20,000 to 200,000 Daltons. Uh, they are shaped by flow. So think of this as melting into a fabricated article. And you could, I've given examples here of automotive, medical, textiles, home and uh, building construction, packaging. Uh, the typical type of polymers that would be used in plastics, some examples are up in the upper right of the slide, along with their, um, their uh, explanation. But they can also come in natural format, not just synthetic. So on the bottom right, you'll see other types of polymers, such as natural rubber, polysaccharide, silk. Uh, and one characteristic is plastics all are considered polymers. So they all have high molecular mass, and they all have some repeating unit of a lower molecular mass. OK. So it's important to note that microplastics, getting back to that, have features both of microparticles and plastics. 
Uh, we know a fair amount about microparticles. You know, we know that we monitor these in our air as part of monitoring standards. We also have a decent amount of information on ingestion of microparticles, although there's more work, I believe, there to be learned. We know a lot about plastics. One thing that we don't know a lot about is microplastics. And there's, as we're here today to talk about critical questions and the needs for answers and where we're at with those answers. Uh, and those are serious and important to get to. One thing that I think is interesting that maybe a lot of people don't know is that there's a lot of overlap in our exposure between natural particles uh, and synthetic particles. So the, the image on the left shows microplastics in purple uh, and on the x-axis is size for both of these figures. And on the y-axis on the left is longevity or lifespan of those particles. Uh, and also on the right is abundance. Uh, and you can see considerable overlap between microplastics and natural particles. So um, this highlights some of the complexity that we have in the space of understanding microplastics from a science perspective, from an effects perspective, from an exposure perspective. So with those terms, what I wanna do is transition now over to talk about how microplastics are formed. And then Margaret will take over with talking about sources. So first, how are microplastics formed? Uh, there's two categories generally of microplastics. One is intentionally produced or called primary microplastics, and the other is secondary microplastics or microplastics that are uh, not intentionally produced. Margaret will get more information on this, but if you think of intentionally produced things like uh, pre-production plastic pellets, even though these are generally speaking in the millimeter range, they fall in the definition of microplastics. But then you'll see things like cosmetic beads, coatings, uh, and there's other types of intentionally produced particles, microplastic particles that are formulated into products for specific functions. Not intentional, though, is when those tend can then if they break down or if you have mismanaged waste in the environment, such as plastic debris uh, or fibers coming off of textile or particles coming off of roadwear. Those are examples. And, and the way you get to that formation is through a variety of different stress events. The most common are mechanical stress that you see up in the upper portion of the of the figure. Those are uh, uh, abrasive type of stresses. You know, you think of wind and, and sand uh, and wave action. But another important one is chemical, uh, and that can be photo degradation. It can be radiation, uh, heat, oxygen. Uh, even some polymers are subject to breakdown by a hydrolysis, particularly if they have ester bonds. And the least likely is biodegradation. Uh, there have been some, in some cases, bacteria and fungi that can break down plastics, depending on the polymer type. In reality, all three of these stress mechanisms work together uh, to uh, result in, over time, not intentionally produced particles. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Margaret. Thanks, Rob. Um, so appreciate uh, you setting this up. Now, um, we all wonder, well, where do microplastics come from? You think they're one thing. Well, in fact, they're not. Uh, microplastics do derive from many sources. Uh, there, we, they, we can call them primary or, and secondary, uh, which is the secondary is where there's a breakdown of a larger product. Um, but in general, um, these all these sources are fairly common. Um, and in particular, uh, you're going to find that um, tires uh, have been seen as a big source um, and uh, synthetic clothing of fibers and breakdown of macroplastics um, on consumer products are are large, but um, in general, we, we can't get our hands around precisely how many microplastics are entering the environment every year, but um, the Pew Charitable Trust came up with an estimate uh, in 2020 that since doubled. Uh, so maybe we're close to, um, you know, a, let's say uh, 8 million metric tons. Of, it's really hard to say. And um, we many people are trying to figure out what the, um, what the breakdown is, but I'll tell you that they're, they're ubiquitous. And so we'll move to the next, um, the next slide, because here are some examples that, that Rob pulled together, which were, are great, gives you a sense of the proportions of these sources. Remember, all these studies and analyses come from uh, field, field samples. And so some of these are from 
um, wastewater treatment plants. Some are from uh, rivers. Some are from the ocean. So, but just give you a sense of the patterns, and that there are many different types. Now, for us in um, in California, we've done a lot of sampling, and uh, you'll hear a little bit about that later. Uh, but we're seeing lots of microplastics, and and all these categories are very similar. So, just giving you a sense of how how, how they're coming from everywhere, and and let's. And let's then move to, and source reduction always is something you want to think about. So having just this general sense is important. Next. So here's the pathway. This is a USGS uh, diagram. And we've talked about these uh, bubbles in the red are sources, as we've said. Uh, let's talk about the pathways. The pathways are in blue. Um, and as many people think about microplastics coming through water, of course, they're coming through um, rivers, streams, on the ocean, direct deposition. But I want to call your attention to the top right, wind and rain. Atmospheric deposition is a big source of this too. And uh, and then it uh, will, you can actually see applications of some microplastics from say sewage treatment plants on uh, soil. And so soil becomes a recipient. And then, uh, so you see there's a whole, um, there's a whole, uh, system of, uh, of mechanisms for carrying these microplastics ultimately to the sea we see uh, but it's but but I think most of the uh, deposition really is on land to start and we've I've seen that it's documented in the literature now and where it goes I'd like to sort of to uh, to just say that uh, Dr. Amari Walker Franklin who's on our panel later has summarized this as uh, the fate of plastics in the environment comes down generally to whether it will float, flow, or sink. So that's the simplest way of saying what this diagram really tells you. And uh, and I just think that the atmospheric um, deposition is something we want to be paying attention to as well as the ocean next and the water. Next. And so one of the things we are, of course, if you've been paying any attention, the ubiquity of microplastics, not only in the environment, but also in bodies of people, uh, are of a grave concern, uh, and, and a lot of questions have come up. We've seen it in all environmental compartments. We've seen it even here in Monterey Bay behind me. We've actually seen that microplastic concentrations in the midwater of our two-mile-deep canyon are greater than in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So you can't always know exactly where they are, but they're everywhere and they're in different concentrations. Um, and uh, one thing I'd also like to say about this is um, they are also pervasive and persistent in the environment. Plastics, whether they're bioplastics or fossil-based plastics, are designed to not break down. They have carbon-carbon backbones. And so they resist de degradation, which means as plastic production increases, we have more a leakage of microplastics. And so uh, the leakage is, we have not stemmed the leakage of plastic into the environment, and so you're just seeing it, you, not only uh, the, the persistence or the, um, the, uh, the presence, endless presence of microplastics in the environment, but also accumulating over time. So this is another grave concern. So next. And so there are certainly we've had a, for a long time, and especially a place like Monterey Bay Aquarium or any uh, biologist is going to be very concerned about the environment. And of course, the environment is part of what we depend on for our lives. Contaminating oil, water, and soil is definitely a concern. The chemical release and transformation, uh, Rob hasn't talked about it yet, but I think he'll get into that. Uh, and ingestion and in inhalation, you know, even microplastics will harm. Uh, animals. Um, this, we will often seen the large macroplastics wrapped around a animals' heads and things, but then they break down and they get into the gut and they affect their um, their uh, their system. Climate change. Uh, I, I'm going to point to the fact that we actually have more particulate matter in the air, and so that does affect the climate. Uh, but also, it's the production of the plastic itself which implicates climate change, and you'll see that in the literature. Uh, transporting of these uh, microplastics. Uh, they can carry invasive species, viruses, and pathogens. So these are all concerns out there. And of course, the microbial growth and community dynamics are an area that are undergoing some study. Um, so generally, very concerning in the environment and in biodiversity because of this. Uh, some people would argue that this is um, microplastics and plastics have um, exceeded our planetary boundaries. Next. And so uh, we're here to talk mostly about the impacts on human health. 
And as I've noted there, uh, the microplastics having been discovered and found in human organs, crossing cell barriers. The major exposure pathways, and we'll talk about it later, are inhaling, inhalation, and ingesting. Those are the major, they're not the only ones, but those are the ones sort of identified as, uh, as those of concern. Uh, and there are three processes uh, that have been identified. One is just, these are physical particles, right? So they, they have impact. And so if you think about it like a particulate matter of breathing it into your lungs, that, that's harmful. Uh, whether or not it's carrying chemicals, it's a physical impact. Then you have toxicity. And there's been some, uh, some studies that have indicated infection and disruption of gut micro, microbiota. And you'll see some more discussion of this later in, uh, in Rob's presentation. And then there's the, the chemicals that are added to the plastics are also something that can carry toxic effects. So these are all the concerns, and there's a lot of research. These two studies, uh, one was from UNEP, which was a, a, a good overview of all the issues, but they, came, they had a section on human health you can look at. And then the Mindrew Monaco Commission on Plastics and Human Health came later. I was a member of it. It also goes into plastics generally, and then some of the mic microplastics. So these are the these are the types of studies that raise these concerns. Next. And then finally, as part of the Mindrew Monaco Commission and some other reports from UNEP and Seoul, you see that uh, certain communities are more harmed than others because of their exposure, uh, disproportionate exposure because of location, proximity, or the inability to have access to cleaner water. And so you'd have um, ingestion in that way uh, and pre-existing conditions. So these are just piling insult upon insult. So these are concerns that you see coming up in the treaty, as well as in the United States, as we wrestle with solutions. Next. And I'm turning over to Ron. Thank you. All right, Margaret, thank you for, for that overview um, about uh, the concerns. Um, I think it's a, important to, to, to transition over to the state of the science. And we'll, we'll cover this in the next few slides about well, what is the state of the science and, and what are the scientific gaps and needs as it relates to both the environmental side and also the human health side. Um, it's natural to have concerns. And as scientists, our objective is to, to address those concerns uh, to try to get to conclusions. Um, and that's essentially what these next few slides are going to talk through. So first I wanna to point to the environmental side and, and on the left is this 2019 report from uh, SAPIA, which is the Science Advice for Policy by European academies. Um, and this is uh, essentially equivalent to the uh, National Academy of Sciences on the European side. And when they assessed the state of the science for the environmental side, they concluded that there was the potential in very rare events to have ecological risk, um, but it, it was contained to specific locations, such as there was some coastal water and sediments where you would be expected to, to have that potential in, in very rare situations. Uh, they concluded that there was a lot already known about nano and microplastics. That's what the NMP stands for. Uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty as it relates to the nature. And in this area, it's particularly complex. You may have seen that from the the sources slide that Margaret showed, but it's also quite complex from the standpoint of the particles, size, shape, uh, the, the chemicals that are in it from non-polymer perspective, concentrations, how things are measured, lots and lots of complex aspects in this field. Uh, and associated with that, there's a real need for improved quality and international harmonization of methods used to assess all the science in this area, particularly of exposure, fate, and effects. So that was the SAPIA report in 2019. Um, coming back to the US, the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, also known as SWERP, did some really outstanding work in 2022 where they were looking at both the environmental and also the human health side. So on the environmental side, they were looking at the state of the science and trying to work towards what type of conclusions can be made. And are we at a point where there can be uh, risk-based management conclusions. Uh, so first, on the risk-based management conclusion, uh, when they looked at the totality of the available data, they came to the conclusion that they actually you could derive a, a risk-based threshold for two effect mechanisms, uh, food dilution and, and tissue translocation. Um, out of the many different types of effects, those are the two that they could derive a risk value. Um, they had high confidence in the framework, 
essentially the skeleton for, for this approach. And they also had high confidence in the analytical uh, approach that was used to, to calculate numbers. They did have relatively low confidence, however, in the actual derived values that came out of that. Uh, and that's important to note. So when you think about risk of an effect, what type of confidence can you put on that risk value that gets to that low confidence? And associated with that, the, those outcomes or conclusions, they had a variety of recommendations as it relates to, to research. Um, they highlighted the need for understanding the microplastic particle really from a characterization standpoint. Analytically, what was used in these, uh, in these effects studies? Uh, what do we know about them? And a lot, a lot of cases, uh, there's nothing or very, very little known about uh, what was actually tested in some of these studies. Uh, particularly as it relates to selection of what microplastic particles used for effects or hazard studies, they, they need to be relevant to and representative to what's in the environment. Uh, they noted that there was a need for high quality studies, both on the aquatic and on the sediment side. Um, and effects needed to be connected to ecologically relevant adverse endpoints. So that's on the environmental side. I wanna transition now over to the human health side. So what is the state of the science for human health? Because that's really the priority of this webinar. In 2019, the World Health Organization conducted an, an assessment and reported that out in terms of microplastics in drinking water. They followed that up in 2022 with dietary and inhalation, and they included nano in that uh, report as well. Their conclusion from that body of work was that the state of the science, the evidence provided by effects, so they didn't discount the fact that there could be adverse effects on human health, but what they said was the weight of the evidence was low uh, because there were substantial limitations in that available data set. I mentioned SQRP before, so they also covered the human health side in their evaluation. Again, working towards a framework for human health. And they concluded in 2022 that it was not possible for human health to derive a risk-based threshold for microplastics. And that was due to a variety of concerns. Uh, most notably, the quality of the studies that, that were available, uh, the reliability of those studies and that data, and also the type of materials that were used in the testing. And I'll get to that in a moment, but uh, they talked about the, the, the most published studies are using these mono dispersed, so defined size round plastic polystyrene particles. Uh, and the question of how relevant those are to anything uh, environmentally uh, present. And we'll get back to that in a moment. FDA earlier this year gave a conclusion on food and they concluded that the current scientific evidence was not demonstrating a level of detection that posed a risk to people. So at a very high level, that's the state of the science. I've, I've already pointed to a few research needs, but let me point out additional research needs. So these are from the World Health Organizations, but you'll see very similar from SWERP or the FDA. So uh, they're pretty representative. So first and foremost, characterization of the microplastic particle that's used in the studies, that is critical. If we're looking for uh, characterizing effects from studies, we need to know what's used in those studies. And in most cases, there's little to no information available from those studies. In some cases there are, but in most cases there's, it's very limited. We need to understand the ability of the, of the human system to be able to take up microplastic particles and where do they go? So that's both from an inhalation route or ingestion through the oral route. We need toxicology studies. We need quality assured, high quality studies that are suitable to be used in risk assessments. Uh, you know, we need all types of toxicology studies, but particularly important are ones that you can then translate into a risk-based decision. And we need to characterize the exposures in those studies. It's not sufficient to just put a material into a test system. You need to validate that it got to where it was intended to go. And that in most cases is entirely missing. And lastly, sampling and analysis cannot be 
overemphasized. The analytical side of microplastic particles and nanoplastics is incredibly important. And it's also one of the most challenging aspects. So I point out air, water, food, beverages here, all of these different types of matrix types are, are similar and different in some ways. One example of this is FDA recently put out their, their publication on regulatory science perspective for analysis in food. And it talks about, and Anil's here with us, he can talk about it later, but uh, it talks about all the uh, rigor that's involved with the methods development side uh, for a regulatory. That doesn't mean that all the good work being done uh, in, a, in a non regulatory perspective shouldn't be used, but it, it needs to be brought in uh, and then further developed. So that was, uh, you, I, I recommend you to go look at this report. I'm not gonna go through this, but I just wanna use this to highlight the challenge in this space. So in, the, in this case, this is a figure from that publication showing food, and you can see all the different steps that are as part of the processing and analysis of a microplastic particle in food and how you interpret that. If you look along the bottom, you'll see that there's opportunities for loss of data or change in data or particles along the way. On the top, you can see in the red, all different areas where you could get contamination of the sample from areas outside of the sample itself. Um, it just highlights the incredible complexity that, uh, that is in this space. You could overlay, instead of food, you could overlay uh, biological tissues, you could overlay air, water, et cetera, and you would see a very similar type of diagram here of complexity. One last thing that I wanna to point to is, again, going back to the type of materials that are used in the toxicology studies. Again, most often, these are these preformed purchase polystyrene type materials. These were originally created for analytical standards. They're not created for use in human or environmental testing paradigms, but yet that's what they're used for because of the high limitation of availability of, of, of suitable materials. So one could question how, how relative uh, are these or representative of even commercially produced polystyrene or polystyrene that could get into the environment, much less how representative are those of other polymer types. Uh, we talk about different types of sizes that are used. And in most cases, you've got a distribution of sizes in terms of exposure. Surface chemistry is, is very important as part of this work. And most of these preformed materials have high surface charge, which is also uh, largely different from what one would expect in the environment. And then lastly, these are just spheres. We've got a variety of other shapes that of course, uh, represent the diversity of exposure that exists. And lastly, again, I go back to composition. In most cases, nothing or very little is known about what's in these materials, not just the polymer, but the non-polymer component as well. So this is a major challenge uh, that still exists in the field. Ultimately, this is critically important because we, you know, we have questions, we need answers as it relates to uh, potential for effects and what that means when we think about exposure in people or the environment. And without having representative materials, we can't answer the questions effectively of hazard or ultimately risk. So I'm gonna transition now to some, some positives. What's being done? There's an incredible amount being done and it changes every day. So up on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see uh, you know, nearly 60 million euros in government spending in Europe directed towards micro and nanoplastics. Uh, you've got a, a high amount of spending in, in China uh, and, and they're producing about 40% of the publications in this space. Other groups such as Canada, the US, Australia, et cetera, are all contributing in to trying to answer questions that are relevant in this space. I wanna use one example from Europe. They work predominantly in consortia, and you can see a variety here. Uh, this is one approach that, that we would recommend considered in the US. Um, it involves multi-stakeholders. Uh, they tackle specific and, and broad projects and, and problems, whether it's human health, uh, agricultural, uh, analysis and food, um, critical endpoints such as uh, you know, inflammatory or reproductive, 
These are all being looked at it to some level uh, in these types of consortia studies. Lastly, I wanna talk about what industry is doing, uh, predominantly through the International Council of Chemical Associations or ICCA. There's uh, regional groups that are all coming together to develop science and try to answer critical science questions. These are all in the area of hazard, analytical and exposure, ultimately aiming to get to a completed risk assessment for human and environmental health. This foundational work is uh, multi-million in terms of spending, and it's also a five-year initial effort. The goal of this is that this information doesn't stay in industry, it gets exchanged. And it, academics and government scientists are critical members as part of this work. Uh, and the industry has set up this information exchange to try to get scientists engaged and communicating across the groups. I give you a reference here uh, that you can go and see all the different projects that are part of this, uh, of this effort under MARI. That's not the only thing that industry is doing. There's also information on that site that talks about additives that are used in plastics. You can find transparent information that's, that's included in terms of regulations, uh, details about specific additives. And lastly, I wanna point out that obviously prevention is critical. So preventing pellet loss from a producer standpoint, like I work for Dow, um, Operation Clean Sweep has been in place for, a, for quite a number of years and it is critical to preventing loss of pellets in the first place. So with that, I'll transition it back over to Margaret. Hi, thanks. Um, I understand we're out of time. I am going to um, just tell you that there are three or four slides coming that really talk about that the governments are acting. I will say that the California the United States is ahead and you're gonna hear some of our panelists later uh, were part of that effort. Um, I would say also that there, this question of whether we have enough information to act is we do. Uh, the, the other, but the question is act in what way? And so um, there's been some urgent uh, work going on to try and see what we can do with what we know. And um, the California strategy is quite interesting and I hope that we can talk about it later, but uh, you know, one of those things is getting a source reduction, figuring out what you can do, monitoring our, our drinking water, figuring out how we can get to regulatory thresholds. But um, this is a very dynamic area uh, I understand scientists always want more science, but someone like me is thinking, well, how, what can we do? And, and, many, and many of you are also. So I just want to say there is hope, uh, there's movement, and I do think that the EU models of science will be helpful also. And I will say that the California work was not just in California, it was global. And, and so that's what's going to be needed to Rob's point. Next. And we have a, a strategy that was just released by the U.S. government. Uh, to respond to the National Academy's report recommendations that we need a strategy and coordination. It's an early days. Um, and I will say also, I'm happy to drop in the chat that there's a, an ELI and Monterey Bay Aquarium report that lays out the legal authorities available to the United States to take on some of these questions because we do have laws on the books and we might need other laws. But, uh, and the other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, Federal action, state action is not the only way of making change. There is also litigation. Uh, toxicity information is important to understand. And so there, are, there, there's, there's, there's a risk to everyone if we don't get this right. And so that's why, um, let's go to the next. Um, we have a lot of work going on. I just wanted to say that these are, this, if you dive into that report, you'll find that all these agencies are diligently working on these questions and there'll be more to come uh, next. And this is the Global Treaty, and so one of our panelists is calling in from a, a, an intersessional working group right now on this Global Treaty. These, all these issues are rising at, at all levels, and now it's at the, at the global level. And there is a section on microplastics and nanoplastics that we don't know how it's gonna end up at our last meeting, but just knowing that reducing uh, chemical additives, reducing the volume of production of certain pro problematic products, they're all on the table in that meeting. And so um, just wanted to know that there, there's more ahead. All this is a very dynamic space. And I think last, we just have a conclusion. Um, I'll leave the conclusions uh, to uh, 
leaving this on the um, website, I think, just because we've run out of time. Um, but it summarizes exactly what we said today. Uh, and next, uh, Rob, you had the path forward. Again, we talk about uh, reducing pollution, being careful how we do it, um, collaboration, and prioritizing this kind of science, all very important. So sorry, I am running fast, but we're out of time. And then uh, we'll turn it over to this amazing panel of experts that's coming up next. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, thank you for those presentations. It was fabulous. Uh, really enjoyed hearing about uh, this more on this complex issue. Uh, there were a lot of questions in Slido. Unfortunately, we're going to have to move to the next com uh, component of the webinar. Uh, please look at those questions. They're really uh, good ones uh, if, if you have time. So we're going to move now to uh, transition to session two, uh, which will be moderated by uh, Dr. Babali Kapoor, who is Principal Research Fellow of Packaging Specialty Plastics and Hydrocarbons at Dow and a member of the Roundtable on Plastics uh, at the National Academies. So with that, uh, Dr. Kapoor, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, John, for that uh, introduction and uh, hello, everyone. So we are going to start off this uh, panel discussion by uh, going back to what uh, Margaret and Robert just set the stage on uh, microplastics, where we are, where we are going, and what remains to be done. And uh, what the intent of this panel discussion is now to do a deep dive into some of the specifics around microplastics. So we want to highlight some of the successes that have been achieved to date in understanding microplastics, the sources, the impact that they have, what we can derive from past learnings that we can leverage into the microparticle and the microplastic domain, and what future work needs to be done to bridge some of the gaps. And to address some of these questions and provide answers to the path forward and guidance to the path forward. We have our panel of uh, six experts over here, and we are going to start off by first asking them to give a brief introduction, and then we will do a deeper dive into the questions that were submitted by the participants in this uh, webinar. And thank you very much also for the early submission of the questions which have helped us guide the discussion with the panels. So with that, I'm going to start off with our first panel member, Dr. Suzanne Brander. Suzanne is an associate professor in the Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Science Department and Coastal Oregon, and Coastal Oregon Marine Experimental Station at Oregon State University. And with that, I will hand over to Suzanne. Suzanne, please turn on your camera and please give us a brief update of your background and your views on the state of microplastics. Okay. Thank you so much um, for the introduction and for the opportunity to uh, be on the panel today. Um, I am an environmental toxicologist. I'm also co-lead of the Pacific Northwest Consortium on Plastics, and I'm part of the Scientist Coalition for an Effective Global Plastics Treaty. Um, I've been conducting research on microplastics and now nanoplastics and related pollutants for about the past 10 years, with a focus on biological responses in fish. Uh, much of this is in the context of environmental impacts, but my research group has also done work relevant to human health, um, in part with working groups with the state of California and also in the sense that fishes as vertebrates are widely used as a model for predicting the effects of pollutant exposure in humans. Um, we know that micro nanoplastics as well as microfibers, which are shed from synthetic clothes, um, can make their way to remote corners of the world, as well as to be ingested by and transported within the bodies of living organisms, um, including us. Uh, so uh, just briefly work myself and collaborators do with relevant particles that we make on site. 
um, in part in response to seeing so many polystyrene sphere studies, um, as was mentioned by uh, Rob during the SCORP work I was involved with. Um, it indicates um, that microplastics made from fibers or those shed from tires and other types of plastics, they all can interfere with the way fish and other vertebrates grow um, and behave. A smaller particles and fibers appear to potentially be more toxic and maybe more able to translocate than other particle types. Um, and we see that exposure to these particles can even change the way genes are expressed. Um, so we're trying to understand effects in the lab and effects um, in samples and are looking at everything from fish to biosolids and also trying to better understand um, what's happening in food webs. Um, and all to told, we may just be scratching the surface because our work doesn't yet include being able to detect nanoplastics um, in samples. So, thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. <clears throat> Our next panelist is Dr. Imari Walker Franklin. Imari is a research scientist at RTI International and a member of the Roundtable on Plastics at the National Academies. Imari? Thanks, Bobby. Hi everyone, my name is Amari. I am a research scientist at RTI International, where my focus is using analytical chemistry, such as high resolution mass spectrometry to determine human and environmental exposure to potentially harmful substances. Um, one example is microplastics in particular, where I spent the last eight years really trying to understand what are the hazards, the exposure, and the human and environmental health risk of these uh, materials and the chemicals that are associated with these plastics. Um, in the lab, we do both detection and quantification of these substances, along with characterization, and collaborate with toxicologists to do larger um, in vitro studies that could be used for human health risk assessments. So in, and in 2023, last year, I also co-authored the book on plastics with uh, Dr. Jenna Jambach. Um, and I spent a lot of my time talking about this issue um, with folks to, to really understand what is the, the human health risk associated with plastic pollution. So I think like we, we mentioned before, microplastics are such a complex problem um, because so many different things fall under the definition of a microplastic. And, um, you know, even with that, we also have the fact that there are chemicals that are placed inside those plastics. We know that there are now 16,000 different chemicals associated with plastics. And um, from a recent study, they said about 25% are potential chemicals of concern. Um, and a vast majority of those have not been well studied for their toxicity. And so that's a, an area that I've, I'm, you know, um, leaning towards learning more about what are the releases of those chemicals from microplastics into different human matrices or into the environment that we're, you know, exposed to. Um, in addition, these small pieces of plastic can also host things like pathogenic bacteria, viruses, and even adsorb potentially hazardous heavy metals um, or other uh, persistent organic pollutants. Uh, however, you know, it takes a lot of work to study these. Um, studies on human health are increasingly difficult because of the complexity of the substance, the lag in technology and talent development, and the you know, somewhat limited interdisciplinary collaborations. I think um, Rob highlighted some really great ones, but you know, there's, there's a lot of folks that are interested in this work um, and it's hard to be accessible. Um, and then of course, the lack of harmonized methods to study both microplastic detection and health impacts. And so um, current studies are, are kind of hard to put together for, for risk assessments due to these gaps, um, but I believe conversations like these in the webinar are key to, to bridging this. Thank you. Thanks, Mari. We'll now proceed on to uh, Dr. Anil Patri. Dr. Anil is the director of Nanocore and chair of the Nanotechnology Task Force at the FDA. Uh, Anil, your remarks? Yeah, thank you, Bob Lee. Um, it's my pleasure to serve on this panel to share our experience uh, with micro nanoplastics. Um, as you all know, FDA is a regulatory agency that regulates drugs, devices, biologics, vaccines, food, bottled water, and cosmetics. So many of the studies reported the presence of microplastics in several of these FDA regulated products, uh, such as bottled water, seafood, animal food and feed, salt, sugar, and beverages. We have been monitoring scientific literature and research on micro nanoplastics 
and collaborating with other federal agencies through the National Nanotechnology Initiative, uh, coordinated by the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office, to address scientific questions and knowledge gaps. Since this is also a topic of global concern, FDA actively participates in discussions with the regulatory entities from across the globe. We organize many global summits and workshops to understand the implications of these increasing contaminants in the environment and the products we regulate. Fortunately, there is decades of research on polymers, as Rob mentioned, uh, and on nanomaterials, mostly on engineered nanomaterials uh, that we can learn from and apply the knowledge to micro nanoplastics. As Rob also mentioned in the introductory section, in the uh, we have set up a public website that you may be interested in on micro nanoplastics in foods to provide FDA perspective on this subject. Uh, we included scientific regulatory information. There are many questions that are coming up because of the news articles and publications uh, and our research and, and, and publications on this subject. I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Back to you, back to you, Bobli. Thank you. On to our next panelist. Our next panelist is Dr. Scott Coffin. Scott is a research scientist with the California Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. Scott. Thank you, Bobby. Um, from 2019 to 2022, I led research investigating the human and ecological health effects of microplastics to fulfill some legislative mandates from California Senate Bills 1422 and 1263 back in my role at the California State Water Resources Control Board. Both of these bills required that the State Water Resources Control Board and the Ocean Protection Council in California develop a statewide microplastic strategy to address contamination in the environment as well as in drinking water. They also required that we develop a regulatory definition of microplastics, which I authored back in 2020. Uh, for our health assessment, uh, Dr. Ellis Hutchings mentioned this briefly earlier, um, but um, just a little bit more information. We, we organized an expert work group of toxicologists with backgrounds in microplastics research to develop a framework to assess the risks of microplastics and populate it with the best available information from the scientific literature. Um, as part of this assessment, we conducted an extensive literature review of laboratory studies testing the hazards of microplastics and extracted key information, allowing us to conduct meta-analyses. The primary goal of this assessment was to inform investigative monitoring plans for microplastics in drinking water, as well as in the marine environment, by determining what type of factors may influence the microplastics hazards, such as size, shape, polymer type, associated chemicals, et cetera, um, as well as what concentrations adverse effects might occur. This allowed us to better tailor our monitoring plans and ensure that we're using the most appropriate analytical methods to inform future assessments. Um, another goal of this effort was to highlight the critical data gaps in the literature so that we could inform future studies to fill in those gaps and improve our analytical methods so that we are collecting the most reliable and informative data for our efforts. Um, we'll be starting monitoring in 2025 approximately and about 28 water systems across the state. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. So we'll go ahead and now start the Q&A session. And before we go into it, I would also like to point out to the audience that the pains to which the organization committee has gone to assemble a panel, which is representative of all different sectors. So we have panelists over here from government, from nonprofit organization, government, both state and federal level, as well as industry and also from academia. And we also want to thank the audience for submitting their questions early. The Slido was opened uh, for submissions about a week ago and we received many questions than we are going to be able to address in the time today. But the National Academies team is looking at options to provide more information on questions that we might not be able to address in this particular panel discussion. And we'll be looking to see if they can be uh, topics for further discussion in future 
uh, sessions. We do want to encourage you to continue to submit questions through Slido. And they will also be uh, questions that are already submitted. Also look to upload those questions so that we can find time to ask the panel to address some of them. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and start with the first question that was submitted. And I will ask uh, Imari to help us uh, answer this one. So Imari, what are some of the ways we can successfully bridge gaps in science and data on hazard exposure and health risks from microplastics? Thanks, Bobby. So I think there's a few different ways. One is using um, more you know, environmentally relevant or human health relevant microplastics. Um, even the standard reference materials, expanding them to different polymer types would help. Um, expanding them from just being spherical would, would definitely help with those experiments. And then some of the work that I even do currently at RTI is using real world microplastic samples from recycling facilities. So those are things that people, you know, could be exposed to on in an occupational level to really understand what, what would that impact be if they were breathing it in um, while they're doing that work. So I think we need to do um, more kinds of studies like that and then better characterization of those plastics when we're doing that work. Um, and then also thinking about other ways that we can develop talent and collaborate because uh, to actually do microplastic analysis or characterization is really time consuming and um, labor intensive and specialized. So, um, you know, the, if we wanna do larger scale studies to understand human health impacts, we need scientists, engineers, statisticians, and health professionals working together to really understand this work. And, and we'll be able to answer these questions quicker and get more quality data. Um, and then of course, you know, providing funding and thinking about um, even some biomonitoring type studies for the future would be very helpful. I think there's some new studies looking at reducing, changing from drinking primarily bottled water to uh, tap water in a glass um, and looking at the blood pressure of, of individuals. Things like that could be scaled up to really see, you know, on a population level, um, what's happening and then measuring those, those microplastics or those chemicals in the body. So there's lots of very interesting science, but we need, we need more people, we need more funding and um, we need better quality data. Thanks, Imari, for that. I was uh, so eager to jump into the questions that I forgot about two of our panelists. So Margaret and Robert are reappearing on our panel, and you just heard from them. So apologies to Rob and Margaret for that. But continuing on the question, I'll also ask others, and especially Anil, do you have any additional thoughts on the knowledge gaps that need to be bridged with respect to microplastics? Um, yeah, thank you again. This is um, an excellent question. We have many knowledge gaps, especially on nanoplastics, as well as microplastics. Um, um, first of all, the methods and methodologies, especially for complex mixtures, uh, quantitation, their additives, chemical contaminants, it's up to them. Um, and then their quantitation in complex matrices. It's one thing to characterize this material in pristine matrices. Um, and single entity material, such as those that we um, learned over the years on nanomaterials for the last two decades. And, um, but then the environmental um, contaminants, especially if they are in uh, uh, food and seafood, for example, to figure out what different compositions are present, how much of uh, each of those are present um, and where they are present. And so uh, that'll, inform about the exposure uh, and to do any kind of assessment. The other thing is standards. Um, Rob also mentioned, and I saw Imari also mentioned about the uh, um, polystyrene publications. And, and while they are important to understand how size um, and compositions can um, have biodistribution, we need to have reference materials and methods. Uh, in the context, uh, NIST and uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology and Joint Research Center. They're working together on collaborative reference material to mimic real world materials that we really need. Uh, currently what is available from a composition standpoint is uh, the polymer kit from Hawaii Pacific University. 
uh, that are made available. So one can get around 30 different uh, polymers in one kit and uh, develop methods that we can cross validate across the labs. Um, also in terms of standards, ISO and ASTM are looking into standards readiness. Uh, they take a long time, but what test methods need to be developed and that can be used for broader, uh, by the broader research community. Another is a toxicity um, and especially mixtures toxicology. What is the biodistribution and fate of these different compositions of microplastics and especially nanoplastics where there is very limited information on nanoplastics. And as this workshop is uh, centered around human health effects, um, we have seen many publications of the presence of microplastics in different organs, in blood, in urine, uh, but the as one of the questions that came up, the long-term effects are certainly not known. Um, and this is something that we really need to work on uh, to understand these uh, implications, um, not just exposure, uh, but sometimes it could be even be immunotoxicity of these material. And again, there are many lessons learned from nanomaterial exposure, engineered nanomaterial that we can use uh, in that context. Thanks, Anil. Um, anyone else to add to what uh, Amari and Anil said? I, I'd like to add one thing if I could, Bobby. Okay, go ahead. Maybe, maybe one point, uh, Anil, you had mentioned the Hawaii Pacific University and the polymer kit. Um, I, I'd like to add into that. So American Chemistry Council had uh, was one of the key drivers to get that kit put together in collaboration with Hawaii Pacific University and NIST. Um, and they were working also on the Polymer Kit 2.0. And a few years back, ACC also sponsored a reference material workshop that, that brought together a variety of stakeholders to try to work towards this aspect of reference material and, and how difficult it is to frame, but then also working towards production of, of microplastic particles that that can be used in these scientific studies. And, you know, that effort still continue. I know that NIST and Hawaii Pacific Unity University and even RTI and, and other good institutions have been making good progress. If we wanna get towards long-term health effects though, we need uh, a large volume of microplastics to be able to be used in those types of studies. Um, so we're working from something that's a, a very small bench scale production to something much more significant. And uh, as opposed to nanomaterials where material was, was commercially produced as a product, microplastics in most cases are, uh, as mentioned earlier, broken down from larger fabricated articles. And so we're essentially talking about state of the art technology to try to get to something that's a microparticle for testing that then is relevant. And we haven't even mentioned the aspect of environmental aging, which is a whole nother aspect that's really important in this space, uh, highlighting the complexity of how particles change in the environment, uh, how bacteria and other uh, film formation occurs. So just another aspect of consideration. Yeah, thanks for that, Rob. And I think what Imari, Anil, and you have done is also put into context the complex problem that we are trying to solve over here, because sometimes we get impatient. Why don't we have results? And what you're saying is, what are some of the reasons why we don't have results? Because we truly want to address the root cause of the problem and deliver solutions that make a difference. And so then I will move on to Scott because there has been work done in California. And Scott, can you share with us what were the main findings of the California State Water Board's research concerning the health effects of microplastics in drinking water? Um, absolutely, I'd be happy to. So in our comprehensive review in 2022, we had identified 31 in vivo and 41 in vitro mammalian studies that had tested effects of microplastics uh, in laboratory settings. And we focused on the in vivo studies. These were live animal studies due to the lack of available methods for extrapolating between these cell culture studies and, and in vivo studies for microplastics. Uh, 
Of those 31 in vivo studies, we screened these for quality criteria to ensure that we're using the most reliable and relevant data. And just 12 of those studies were deemed fit for purpose for our uh, further analysis. With seven of those studies reporting adverse effects on male and female reproductive systems, and five reporting effects on various other physiological endpoints. Uh, none of these studies met all of our desired quality criteria. However, collectively, we have observed a trend in toxicological effects relating to biomarkers of inflammation and oxidative stress. And we furthermore determined that studies in rodents exposed to some types of microplastics through drinking water indicate potentially adverse effects, including on the reproductive system. However, more research was needed to understand the potential human health implications of that research, and particularly at what concentrations adverse effects may occur. Some additional findings from our work group included the finding that particle size is a strong factor for toxicity with smaller particles being more likely to translocate into tissues than larger ones. And that traditional approaches to characterize the dose response effect of microplastics, such as looking at the dose, are not reliable estimates as, as more complex approaches that consider the particles relevant effects of, of mechanisms in the body. So for example, we observed particles interacting at the cellular level, which may be best predicted by the total surface area of the particles that are actually small enough to cross those barriers, as opposed to the total mass. Um, based on our expert work group findings, we were unable to derive a regulatory level for microplastics in drinking water based on some key data gaps. Um, the, the biggest being we don't have a clear understanding in the toxic mode of action, how these particles are causing these effects in these rodent studies. And we have limited data on which types of microplastics are hazardous uh, based on shape, uh, microplastic shape, size, and polymer type. Uh, we also don't fully understand how much microplastics exposure is coming from drinking water versus other exposure sources. Um, and we, we wanted to, to fill in these data gaps before really getting a regulatory level. Um, that said, we did develop a public communication uh, toolkit for drinking water systems, which will be uh, which will start monitoring next year. Uh, this was a crucial step in ensuring that we can effectively and transparently communicate these findings to the public. Thank you. Thanks for that information, Scott. So also moving on again to solution space, um, Suzanne, um, how can we systemically incentivize plastic pollution recaptures? Because Rob and Margaret talked about how plastics end up in the environment and how they cause pollution. So how can we stop that pollution from happening? And how could these strategies, incentives, change for different size, location, and sources of uh, microplastics and other pollutants? Sure, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll answer first from a bigger picture perspective and then give a few specific examples. Um, incentivizing the recapture and collection of plastics really needs to come from several different angles. Um, better waste management is, of course, essential. Uh, educating communi communities, educating people is essential, but we can't put all of the responsibility on consumers as we really have been doing. Um, one tool that is being used by five states, I believe, at this point, including Oregon, is extended producer responsibility. Um, this means that manufacturers of products like packaging, for example, have to pay for and manage the recycling of those materials that they produce. And you know, funding for that has to come from the state level or maybe someday from the federal level, for example. Uh, we also need to simplify recycling and make recycling programs more uniform across the country. Um, you shouldn't drive two hours from your home and have completely different rules for recycling or what can and can't be recycled. Um, there have been calls uh, to simplify product design, um, to use fewer plastic types, fewer chemicals, chemical simplification, um, which sounds easy, but it's complicated, um, to make recycling easier, um, more cost effective um, and safer. Um, recycling is complex because you can use it to recover plastic, but the quality is lower each time. Um, and combining plastics means you're combining the mixtures of chemicals that are used to make the original items. And even if it's the same type of plastic, uh, 
there could be, you know, there were what Amari mentioned, 16,000 different potential chemicals. Um, so that's kind of a lot of combinations. Um, also right now we only recycle 5%, so that's clearly not the only answer to collecting and recapturing. Um, it works for larger plastic items. Sometimes um, there's been talk of switching to compostable bio-based plastics to increase recapture and potentially decrease the creation of microplastics um, because those are composted, but we don't have, um, I don't, there's only a handful of industrial composting facilities in the country. And so we're really kind of putting the cart before the horse in some ways because we're putting these bio-based plastics out there, but how do we how do we deal with them? So we're, we're, we're making some progress in some areas, but, but not others. Um, ideas for keeping smaller plastics out of the environment, um, such as microfibers and tire particles, which are two of the largest microplastic sources um, that we're currently aware of at least, include things like adding or requiring filters on new washing machines um, that keep fibers, at least from going to wastewater treatment plants that really don't have a way to deal with them. Um, I think Margaret mentioned the biosolid issue that we are good at getting particles out of effluent, but we're not good at getting them out of solids, which are then used as fertilizer. Um, so that's a whole a whole different, different issue. Um, in terms of tire particles, which are coming off of roads, tire and road wear, putting in stormwater catchments or um, rain gardens, have, people have seen some success with that. But, but in the end, you're still taking those particles and capturing them and putting them into a landfill. So, you know, business as usual, meaning we just keep making the same amount of plastic or making more of it while just attempting to capture it downstream is not ultimately going to work um, because we really need a solution that includes upstream measures like reducing what we're producing, reducing the amount of virgin plastic we're producing, the, the number of single use plastics and, and legislation has been proposed at the federal level to do that. Um, so reducing plastics at the source by making um, less to begin with, switching to safer alternative materials, even like glass um, for some products um, and redesigning products like textiles and tires so they shed less um, and contain fewer harmful, chem harmful chemicals is, is really where we should be headed. And I realize that's a lot, that's a long list of things to do, but um, that's my answer for now. Well, it is a complex problem. So thanks for all those insights, uh, Suzanne. Um, I'm gonna move on now to the next question that was submitted. So overall, what is known about the health impacts of microplastics? So I will ask this question to Rob. And Rob, related to that, there are uh, two other questions. Um, so I'll just call them out. And so the two other questions are, um, what data is available on human exposure to microplastics as a function of geographic distribution within US cities and rural areas? And what are the key challenges in delaying advances in the science of microplastic impact on health? So first question, what is known about the health impact of microplastics? All right, yeah, thank, thanks for that question. Um, some of this was covered uh, in, in Margaret's presentation about concerns. Uh, so we think of, if I were to categorize health effects, I actually would put it into a couple different approaches. I'd put it into uh, exposure. What do we know about exposure? What do we know about actual hazard or effects? And how do we put that into context? You know, frankly speaking, right, that's the risk assessment process. Um, and I think we can conclude that there is exposure. I mean, we've talked about, uh, Margaret talked about uh, the fact that microplastic particles are in the environment around us. She talked about the fact that there are reports of microplastic particles in people. Uh, I mentioned the fact that we, we actually are in a particle, you know, rich matrix of, uh, of our environment between uh, synthetic particles, but then also natural particles. And, and I would argue that there's a lot to be learned also from not only the, the microplastic particle space, which is critical to understand and to get answers to some of these concerns, we also need to contextualize that to what we can understand about our overall exposure to particles, because I think that's one aspect that's not really being studied alongside the, the plastic side of this equation. Um, we need to take the exposure reports very seriously. I go back to what Anil said uh, and others about 
the, the challenges of analytical. Uh, and I showed in my presentation this, this flow chart of the process that FDA is looking at from a food perspective. That same challenge exists uh, on, a, on a biological matrix perspective. So for example, uh, one there was one publication that talked about particles in the deep lung. Um, biologically speaking, scientifically, it, it doesn't seem plausible that you could get the size of particles into the deep lung based on what we know about particle exposures and inhalation. Um, but on the other hand, it's pl very plausible that you could be having particles in, in blood. Uh, there's a number of human stool studies that are out there that talk about microplastic particles in, in human stool. That's a mechanism for sure in which you could have plastic particle exposure. It doesn't tell you where in the body it goes. It just told you that at some point there was exposure and it, it, most of it probably did not get absorbed at all and just went straight through the system. Um, the underlying challenge in this space is, is analytical and verification of what's present, because we need answers in terms of what's there, in terms of being reported. Is it verifiable? Is it replicatable to some extent? Um, so that we can understand what that exposure is. Uh, I mentioned earlier about effects. There, to my knowledge, there's not one regulatory guideline compliant study on plastic microparticles. We, we have a lot of data on small number, small studies using these polystyrene microspheres. What we still lack to date is robust quality assured studies that, that use established protocols to look at effects. And that's where you get to the long-term effects question uh, of whether it's to a specific um, tissue. You know, there's concerns about reproductive toxicology, but there's also basic understanding of can relevant particles cause human health relevant effects in general? We haven't even answered the in general question, much less the specific. So there's a great need in this space. Ultimately, that all has to come together so that we can, not we, the scientific community, make science-based decisions and, and policy decisions in this space. And until we uh, continue to advance and, and I support funding of the needed work, uh, particularly by the US government, so that that can be advanced through the audience here to be able to move these questions to conclusions. Thanks, Rob. So uh, just one other question that was there was that, uh, do we have uh, human exposure data within the US cities versus rural areas? I do remember in your presentation, Margaret, in your presentation, you showed information about the uh, distribution of microparticles from different studies, but do we have that for the US? I don't know that we do. I'm going to re re defer that maybe to some of the other scientists. What I, we did use in the Mindura Monaco report was exposure to chemicals. Uh, that we do have a number. The U.S. government maintains the NHANES database, which shows body burden of certain uh, uh, certain uh, chemicals, which may be carried by microplastics. And so that's where we came up in our, that report with an astronomical level of e of the medical costs uh, and human health costs in dollars. And so, um, you know, I think that would be nice to sort of compare what we're getting. Much of this is probably, as I've heard, uh, very uh, either geographically limited or uh, targeted at one thing or the other. I think Scott and Susanna and maybe Amari could speak to what they've seen, but that's been uh, my understanding. The body burden of microplastics probably has not. Okay. Uh, been measured in that way, but I defer to the panel. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm just going to do a quick time check. Uh, I think we are going to be running out of time, and there are several questions that have come in through uh, Slido also. So, um, uh, I'm just going to give the last one to you, Margaret, over here again. Um, what is collaboratively being done across uh, key sectors uh, to solve the microplastic issue? And I think all of you alluded to it, that 
more research is needed and also research is needed across all different sectors, all the way from government, academia, health, medical, chemical industry to uh, solve the microplastic issue. So any uh, final words on that, uh, uh, Margaret? Uh, and I'm going to try to squeeze in one Slido question if I can. Uh, quickly, could you address yeah. that? I would just say that the, these are is beginning. Microplastics is a subset of plastics. Everything is moving at the same pace, which is very rapidly. I would say some countries are ahead. And so we've seen um, legislation in U the EU that has been more hazard-based than risk-based. I mean, there's a lot of ways that's coming together with the science, scientific collaborations that are occurring. And we there should be more on priority questions because, I, you know, this is the public sets the expectation for policymakers. And so if the policy is not reflecting societal needs, then they have, that has to change. Um, but we also haven't focused on this enough. And, and so, you know, prevention, I think some of the ways that California took, took this, they brought a lot of people around the table, uh, I think, and they didn't leave it at the boundaries of California. I think there's that. There are, you know, there are a consortia looking at plastics and what, are, uh, what, are, what kinds of plastics need to be reduced. There are those things happening. A lot of them have been piecemeal, and particularly in the U.S. government, where agencies have their 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 silos. Uh, the we we're only at the beginning of having people come together, and so I would say there are patterns and examples we can use to to move this faster. If you look at climate change, we worked very hard to pull the science together to move uh, decision making and uh, communicate it well. We are very in an early stage there, but I do think that it's possible. The National Academies Roundtable was one um, outgrowth of the National Academies um, report, which said you need all sectors working together. This is this is this has to happen, and, and it has to be on a level playing field, meaning uh, not in the context of a negotiation. It's very difficult. So I would say that there's space for this if we make it. And probably if I can add to that, uh, what Margaret has said, I'm, I guess, the only federal member in this panel. Um, so we do have an interagency interest group on micro nanoplastics. This being formed uh, some six years ago. Um, so we meet once every two months to kind of figure out what each agency is doing. As Margaret mentioned, we are all in our silos and sometimes uh, you don't know what the adjacent lab is doing. Uh, but we do meet uh, very frequently. We understand what each agency is doing and interested in doing. Uh, and then I can summarize very quickly. Some of the agencies are funding this work, NSF, NIH, NIHS. They are uh, funding some of the external research. Uh, EPA is doing quite a bit of work. You know, you have seen some of the reports that came out of EPA, EPA earlier workshops. Uh, we know of NOAA Marine Debris Program. Again, there is a, a lot in the oceans on micro nanoplastics that, because of the degradation. And so they are funding research into marine debris, which includes plastics and, and microplastics, not specific. Um, and so there are you know, other agencies that are you know, conducting research and then coordination. So that coordination is between almost 20 different agencies that are coming through together through the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. And uh, we have uh, public uh, workshops that we organized to answer this specific question on what, what feds are doing about it. And so I can uh, provide the links to, the, um, to that workshop that's again publicly available there on YouTube, uh, agencies that are conducting research and, and regulation. So I'll stop there, but we do uh, not, you know, not only between the agencies, but we also work with other uh, stakeholders on this. I'll subject. just break in to say there is no federal priority setting yet, which I hope will come out of this national strategy on what's the most important thing to focus on. Otherwise, it's a, a sea of research that is in all important, but what is most important? And I think that's our next step. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and summarize very quickly and hand it over to the next activity. And uh, so from everything that I heard over here is that we all, all of us want fast answers 
And just to paraphrase, um, if you want something fast, you go at it alone. But if you want to go far, then you go together. And what we need over here is collaboration across all of the different sectors. We need to leverage the information that we already have in hand, whether it is in the US, whether it is internationally generated information. And then we need to see how we can move forward with solutions that are true solutions and do have an impact, a positive impact on our environment and on our health. So I want to thank all the panelists for your discussion, for your input and the experience and knowledge that you brought to the table and look forward to future seminars based on some of the questions that were submitted and we could not address all of them today. So with that, I will hand it over to Margaret to carry out the next uh, interactive um, activity that we've got planned over here in the few minutes that remain. Thank you. Thank you, Bobly. And so he here was our introduction to microplastics. Uh, we we uh, decided and the, the team at NASIM decided to do a word cloud before the webinar. And now we're testing ourselves to see if we've confused you more or clarified anything or clarified the question. So first we're gonna show the word cloud that came in before we even started, if we could put that up, of what people are asking in the Slido. This was before. You can see a lot of concerns about the long-term impact of uh, water and drinking water, how it's everywhere, the health issues, of course. This is, this is what people came in with. Um, and now we're going to ask you in the background to fill in Slido to say what your, what your questions are today and what you might want to prioritize. Um, so we're going to do that as we close out and we'll share that uh, word cloud and we'll, we'll be testing ourselves, but that word cloud will probably drive us to our next webinar. So thank you all for your attention. Um, so go to Slido, ask your questions, and see, and we'll we'll show we'll show it to everybody and see how it looks. Thanks. Thank you. As we're as we're closing out today, I've got a couple of minutes. Um, this was a fabulous uh, session. I think uh, we raised a lot of questions, a lot of great comments in the chat, uh, as well as the Slido. Very much appreciate the audience and your thoughts. Uh, this will inform our work in selecting topics for this webinar series on microplastics. It's been quite a productive discussion. We heard a number of things about what we know, what we don't know, um, what are microplastics, including dimensions, composition sources, the highlighted concerns of the white detection of microplastics in the environment and the potential health risks, the need for improved data quality and ongoing research investments. There's a lot of data out there, uh, but we need more and we need more high quality data. And then uh, we heard from the last panel sharing their perspectives on the lessons they have learned in studying microplastics and future research questions and needs and opportunities. So um, I'd like to take, I'd like to thank our speakers and our panelists for joining us today to share their expertise. I'd also like to thank the EHMI and Roundtable on Plastics members and the National Academy staff for doing all the heavy lifting to make this happen. Um, let's see if we can, if do we need, do we have a new generated uh, word cloud to look at? Maybe not. Martha, as I'm going to get on here, um, we don't have a new generated uh, cloud. Unfortunately, there's not enough. Uh, there's not enough uh, voting. I mean, uh, submission right now, but uh, okay. uh, well, we tried. We'll get, we'll, we'll get that out later. And if you would like Thank to you. stay informed on future webinars and activities, please subscribe to the Environmental Health Matters newsletter. Um, look in the in the uh, uh, chat for a link on that. And finally, your voice does matter. Please take a few minutes to fill out the post-meeting questionnaire that will continue to inform this series. Um, thank you all for joining. And with that, I guess we've got a, a minute to spare. Thank you all for joining us. Hope to see you at the next webinar.